Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record in Miss Smith's case. The jury's not present. Miss Smith's not present. Um, I don't think Miss Phillips, you're waving her presence. I don't think she needs to be here for this. Um, let me explain why we're here and what we're doing. I notified the uh, attorneys that yesterday um, the exhibits that went back to the jury initially when they retired to deliberate um, included Exhibit 197, which has not been admitted in evidence. Um, obviously, the rule is that the jury is only to receive um, exhibits that have been admitted. 197 is identified as a sealed evidence bag purported to contain MySpace declaration letters and a data CD. The exhibit was unsealed on April 30th by Detective Ramirez, um, and Exhibit 197.001 was removed and, and marked and entered into evidence as an exhibit. And that is the 197.001 are the declaration letters themselves. So what we had was apparently a CD that um, was part of 197 that went back to the jury that they shouldn't have had. I spoke with the lawyers by phone this morning um, to talk about what we should do. Ms. Phillips has requested, and I think appropriately so, for us to ask the jury or um, for me to question the jury about whether they may have looked at Exhibit 197. I think it's highly unlikely, but I think it's a worthwhile um, endeavor. So we're going to bring them in. I'm going to ask them. I'm going to describe the exhibit. I'm going to hold it up. Forum. I've got it right here, and see if uh, they believe they looked at it. If they did, then we'll talk about what we're going to do. If they didn't, then I think no further action is probably warranted. Um, anyone have any comments or questions about what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get the jury. It's not present counselor here. Good morning, everyone. You're probably wondering why I brought you out here. Um, it's not just to get exercise or because I wanted to just keep our tradition of coming out around the same time of each uh, morning. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, one thing that happened yesterday. One of my jobs is to make sure the exhibits that you get are the actual exhibits that were entered into evidence. Um, you probably know we have multiple exhibits marked and not all of them are entered into evidence and you're to consider only those that are entered into evidence. I mistakenly put in an, uh, an exhibit yesterday that went to you that was not in evidence. And I wanted to check with you and see if it was possible that you had looked at it. So let me describe what it is. I'm already getting no, no. Um, it, it may be an easy answer. If you didn't look at any exhibits yesterday, then we're fine. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, I'm getting yes from everyone. So I don't even have to get into it. It's in a folder. It's a CD. We didn't think so, but we need to make sure um, that you didn't look at uh, an item that was not an exhibit. So that was easy. That was the only question I had. Sorry to drag you out, but when I talk to you, I need to talk to you in front of all the lawyers and on the record and all together. So I just wanted to, to check and make sure. So you're free to go back and that's all we needed you for. So Kim's going to take you back and you're free to resume deliberating. Thanks and sorry for the uh, interruption. Okay, please be seated, everyone. Anyone think any further action needs to be taken? No. Okay. All right. So we'll make sure 197 stays out. They have what they need now, and we'll go forward. While I have you, um, verdict forms for aggravation. Let me ask a question. As I was looking at the verdict forms and looking at the um, instructions, the instruction um, describes the aggravating circumstance as and this is for the conspiracy to commit custodial interference. The offense caused emotional harm to the victims, plural. Do we have plural victims from the state's perspective? Only one charge, Your Honor. That's what I thought. And so I want to make it singular. So we're going to change the instruction to make it singular. And then if you want to take a look at the verdict forms, understanding I'm going to change a plural victims to singular victim. Make sure no one's got an issue with the um, verdict forms. And again, these are the aggravating instructions. And I'll make the changes in terms of plural to singular. Any objections? No. Okay. All right. So we'll finalize these. Anything else we need to talk about? Sorry for dragging everybody down here. Things happen sometimes and just one of those things. But we'll let you know when... Uh, when we hear something from the jury, and I'll see you sometime soon. All right, thanks. Arizona, uh, once a jury has found a defendant guilty 
the question then becomes whether certain what's called aggravating circumstances apply. And this applies to factors that the judge will consider at the time of sentencing. The law is that the jury has to decide one way or the other whether these aggravating circumstances exist. So what's about to happen is I'm about to pass out a much shorter set of instructions to you um, that explain this aggravating circumstances phase. The attorneys are going to make brief presentations to you regarding the aggravating circumstances, and then you're going to retire one more time to deliberate on these aggravating circumstances. So what we'll do now is let me um, ask him to pass out first to the jury and then to counsel the aggravating circumstances instructions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these to you as I read the other instructions, and then I'll uh, talk to you about the verdict forms, and then you'll retire to consider the aggravating circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendant has been found guilty of conspiracy to commit custodial interference and forgery. Under Arizona law, every person guilty of these crimes is presumed to be sentenced to a presumptive sentence. That sentence may be increased by the sentencing judge if aggravating factors are proven by the state. The law requires that you now determine whether the state has proved any of the following aggravating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. These findings will be considered by the court in determining the sentence to be imposed on the defendant. Aggravating circumstances. Number one, as to the conspiracy to commit custodial interference count only, the, the offense caused emotional harm to the victim. Two, as to the forgery count only, the offense involved the presence of an accomplice. In other words, for the count one, the question for you to consider is whether the offense caused emotional harm to the victim. For count two, whether the offense involved the presence of an accomplice. In deciding these issues, you must determine from the evidence presented whether the state has proven these allegations beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury instructions previously given also apply where relevant, including the definition of reasonable doubt and the requirement that each aggravating circumstance, circumstance finding be unanimous. The defendant is not required to testify or produce evidence of any kind. The decision on whether to testify or produce evidence is left to the defendant acting with the advice of an attorney. The defendant's decision not to testify or produce evidence is not evidence of the existence of any aggravating circumstance. You must decide each aggravating factor separately on the evidence with the law applicable to it, uninfluenced by your decision on any other aggravating factor. You may find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt uh, both uh, one or none of the aggravating factors. Your finding for each aggravating factor must be stated in a separate answer. During your deliberations, you were able to discuss the case with each other in the jury room. During this phase of the trial, you may, again, not discuss the case with each other until all of the evidence for this phase has been presented. You have been given instructions and heard closing arguments for this phase of the trial. And so it's clear these are the instructions that you're receiving. Do not form final opinions about any fact or about the outcome of the case until you have heard and consider all the evidence, the closing arguments, and all the instructions I have given you on the law. Keep an open mind. Form your final opinions only after you've had an opportunity to discuss the case with each other in the jury room at the end of this phase of the trial. All eight of you must agree on a verdict. You, If you cannot unanimously agree on whether ag an aggravating circumstance exists, please so indicate on the verdict. Your foreperson will be in charge during your, de your deliberations and will again sign any verdict. You will be given two forms of verdict on which to indicate your decision. They read as follows. So again, I've got two verdict forms. Um, the first one says aggravating circumstances verdict count one. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled cause upon our oaths as to count one, conspiracy to commit custodial interference, do find as to the alleged aggravating circumstances by the X marks below. You've only got one, and it says the offense caused emotional harm to the victim, and you either check proven or not proven, and then the four-person signs. Second one, aggravating circumstances, verdict count two. Again, we, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled cause upon our oaths as to count two, forgery, do find as to the alleged aggravating circumstance by the X marks, X mark below. And again, proven, not proven, the offense involved the presence of an accomplice. So that's the determination you have to make. What's going to happen now is counsel are going to make brief arguments to you with the state, of course, going first because the state's got the burden of proof. Um, the state has the ability to um, also uh, offer a rebuttal argument should it choose. So, Ms. Andrews, you may proceed. Yeah, Ms. Ramudo. Ms. Ramudo, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I would be very grateful as you have been here a very long time and heard from a great deal of witnesses. What we are asking you to rely on in this phase of the trial is the testimony of the witnesses that have already been presented, specifically with regard to the first aggravating factor to the conspiracy charge that the crime caused emotional harm to the victim. We are asking that you rely on the testimony of Logan McQuarrie, who you heard on the very first day of trial testimony in this matter, and the testimony of his father, Frank McQuarrie, who you heard from later during this trial. Logan testified before you about how this has affected his life. He testified how he felt at the time that the crime was being committed, and he testified about how he felt afterward. And he told you that while his son was with the Smiths, and while he did not know where the whereabouts of his son was, that he was worried. And he had no idea where his child was. He told you about afterwards when he met, well, when he spoke with the Smiths on the phone, that he continued to be worried and frustrated about the situation. He told you that he was stressed out by Tammy Smith's actions, that her repeated conversations with him, that her statements to him caused him to be stressed about the situation. In addition, you heard that the last time he ever saw his son was on December 8, 2009. This, ladies and gentlemen, is beyond any doubt something that caused irreparable harm to Logan McQuarrie. You then also heard from his father, Frank McQuarrie, and specifically Frank McQuarrie told you that during the dates of December 20th to the 27th, that Logan was worried and upset and that he had a range of emotions during that time. And specifically, Mr. McCurry, Frank McCurry, was asked how Logan was dealing with the custody issue and how he dealt with it at that time. And Frank McCurry told you from this witness stand that his son had a range of emotions from everything from tears to frustration to depression. And then you also heard again from Logan McCurry about how he felt when he heard that Elizabeth Johnson had been found and her son was not with him. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no question that Logan McQuarrie suffered emotional harm as a result of the defendant's actions in this case, where she acted as a co-conspirator with Elizabeth Johnson to take Gabriel Johnson from his life. In regards to the forgery count, we have alleged an aggravating factor that an accomplice was involved. And I think that's quite simple. By the defendant's own words, she was with Elizabeth Johnson at the courthouse that day, filling out the court documents. They filled them out together. Elizabeth filled out one portion, she filled out the rest. There is no doubt that that aggravating factor has been proven. And we do ask that you find both of these aggravating factors were proven by the state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Romino. Ms. Phillips? Thank you. <laughs> To the uh, emotional harm to Mr. McQuarrie, what you need to find now is a special aggravating circumstance, and you can choose whether or not to find or not find that aggravating circumstance. As to emotional harm to the victim, we suggest to you that in any crime with a victim, there is emotional harm to the victim, and that in this particular situation, it does not give rise to any special aggravating circumstances. It's, it's not uh, any different than any other crime with a victim. As to forgery as a count with the alleged accomplice, you heard Ms. Smith testify that she wrote Craig Cherry's name on that document while Elizabeth was standing in line. She acted alone on that, and we ask you to so find that she did act alone in that act and that she did not have an accomplice. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Any rebuttal, Ms. Romano? Ladies and gentlemen, in response, this is not just any crime. The co-conspiracy that Tammy Smith engaged in with Elizabeth Johnson was to permanently deprive Logan McQuarrie of his son, and that's exactly what happened here. This is not an interference with a weekend visit. This is not an interference with a Christmas visit. Their plan was to permanently deprive Logan McQuarrie of his son. Now, what ended up happening 
may not have been part of the original plan, but the original plan was for him to be so stressed out and give up rights to his son that, that he would sign away his rights. There is no doubt that this caused a different kind of emotional stress to Logan McCray in this case. And in regards to the accomplice, aggravator, ladies and gentlemen, you heard Tammy Smith testify, this was part of their plan. She didn't just fill that out on a whim that day. She did it in concert with Elizabeth Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to send back the verdict form so that the aggravating circumstances is going to be submitted to you for decision. Same thing, filling out the forms. Kim will take you back, and we'll wait for you to come back when you're finished. Okay, please be seated, everyone. Uh, my expectation, based on experience, is that this phase does not take a long time, um, so I would prefer that people stay close. I don't want anyone certainly leaving the courthouse. If people want to step out for a few minutes, they can, but typically this phase does not take a long period of time, so we'll wait for the jury to come back. Um, while we're waiting, anything from the state's perspective we need to talk about? No, Your Honor. Anything from the de defense perspective? Your Honor, just the 13703 allegation, when was the court planning on dealing with that? Uh, my intent was to uh, consider the 13703 at the time of sentencing. Um, as I think Judge McMurdy indicated he was inclined to do, I agree with the approach in terms of timing, so that was my intention. If your question is going to be, am I going to um, consider 13703 and or a motion to take Ms. Smith into custody, it's probably the where the inquiry is headed. I don't know if the state was going to make a request or not. I wasn't so much going to make a request on that. I didn't know when the court was going to rule on the 703 motion. But what I would suggest is that perhaps we want a ruling on that separate from the sentencing hearing so the parties know how to proceed as far as mitigation and aggravation. I would imagine the defendant wants to know if she's facing prison time prior to walking in the day of the sentencing. Would you prefer a separate consideration instead of at the time of sentencing? I'm open to that. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. okay. Uh, two things. Number one, I'm not taking Ms. Smith into custody today. Um, number two, um, I will consider the um, 703 issue separately. Um, we'll talk about it, but my inclination is is to give the um, both sides an opportunity to, to further brief now that we've had the trial. Um, I know it's been brief, but anything you want to add? Schedule oral argument likely for about 30 days from now, understanding that then sentencing um, will follow after that, sometime after that. That would be my plan. Okay? All right, so we'll wait for the jury to come back. As soon as, we, uh, as soon as they're ready, we'll come back in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. This is the time set for sentencing in CR 2010-101-760. Dash 002, State of Arizona versus Tammy Peter Smith. Are we ready to proceed with sentencing? Yes, Your Honor. Angela Andrews and Elisa Ramuno for the state. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Michael Lee and Ann Phillips for Tammy Smith. Uh, you know, as usual, I forgot one thing that we discussed back there when we approached briefly. You may. Okay, let's have Ms. Um, Smith come on up. Mr. Lee, Ms. Smith, come on up. Ms. Smith, would you tell me your full name, please? Tammy Faye Peters Smith. What's your date of birth? 31272. You have been found guilty by a jury of the following. Count one, conspiracy to commit custodial interference. A class four felony committed in violation of Arizona law on or between December 17, 2009 and December 28, 2009. And count two, forgery. A class four felony committed in violation of Arizona law on December 14th. 2009. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have you sit down now while we go through the rest of um, yes, the presentation. So go ahead. Um, a couple things before we start. I spoke to the attorneys. I think Mr. Lee wants to make a record regarding um, a legal issue, so I'm going to allow him to do that. I do, Your Honor. I'll be as brief as possible. Um, the defense is objecting to the state. Uh, presenting any evidence in aggravation that wasn't found beyond a reasonable doubt by the jury. Uh, it is our position that Ms. Smith has a constitutional right to have that found beyond a reasonable, a reasonable doubt by the jury. 
and I guess we're requesting so that things go smoothly uh, that defense have a continuing objection to anything other than the two aggravators found by the jury. Okay. Ms. Andrews, I'll let you respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, first of all, the jury found one aggravating factor for each count, and the Blakely line of cases is clear that the state only has to prove one statutory aggravating factor to the jury before the court can consider all aggravating factors. Additionally, Your Honor, the court can, can consider any aggravating factors that weigh mitigation to consider whether or not to start at the presumptive or go lower than the presumptive. So even if we didn't prove aggravators to the jury, the court can still consider aggravating factors to dispute the mitigating factors. And so I, I think the line of place cases is clear that we certainly can talk about them, although I'm not sure that's even going to be necessary to discuss at this point. Okay, thank you. I agree with the state's position. I believe they're entitled to talk about the aggravators because of the proof of an aggravator for each count. Um, Ms. Andrews has indicated that she may not even talk about other statutory aggravators. To the extent she does, or to the extent that you have any objection based on what you just told me, it is a continuing objection that I'll note. You don't have to, to make it, um, and I believe you have preserved it uh, for the record. Um, I have reviewed as part of um, my review for sentencing the pre-sentence report prepared by the adult probation department. I'm obviously very well aware of the facts. I presided over the trial, so I know the facts and I uh, know what happened at trial. Um, I have reviewed uh, the letters attached to the pre-sentence report, which were mostly letters from the McQuarrie family. I reviewed defendant's sentencing memorandum and the attachments, and then the, there were multiple attachments um, that uh, were filed supplements, uh, which enclosed letters written on behalf and in support of uh, Ms. Smith. Um, I reviewed specifically an email that came to me from the probation department from Logan McQuarrie. I think I received that yesterday um, as well. Um, I also received many unsolicited letters from all over the country from people who apparently had watched the trial on television. Um, I appreciate uh, the interest that people have. I certainly appreciate and understand the concern about baby Gabriel and what's happened with baby Gabriel. Um, but with respect to letters from um, people who don't have any personal involvement in this case, whether they know one of the parties, whether they're involved in the investigation, or whether they're being um, utilized to present uh, information to me today, I'm simply not going to consider what somebody feels around the country. And I received a lot of extensive letters. From my perspective, I can't get into what everyone thinks everywhere else about the case, about Ms. Smith, about Mr. McQuarrie. What I care about is what I saw in the courtroom and the information I received from you and other interested parties, such as the McQuarrie family, such as Ms. Smith, people that she knows and can speak from personal knowledge about her. So I want to make that clear. While I understand and respect people who feel very strongly about this case, I'm not taking those letters into consideration going forward. Um, so with that, uh, Ms. Andrews, from the state's perspective, does the state have a sentencing recommendation and a victim's rights been complied with? Your Honor, victim's rights have been complied with, and uh, Frank McQuarrie would like to address the court. Okay. Mr. McQuarrie, come on up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What would you like to tell me? Well, sir, it's been... Uh, a long couple of years. Um, basically, through all of this, um, we still don't know where Gabriel is. We fear the worst, um, and we fear that we will never see him again. Um, part of that has occurred because of the actions that Tammy Smith did. Um, I've paid attention to everything that I've heard here at the trial. Um, and I haven't heard any remorse from her except for the fact that she got caught, she got found guilty. Um, she's never been media or camera shy. Uh, I heard an apology from her attorney, but I've heard nothing even in her testimony that said that there was any any sorrow there for, for what had occurred. I'm sure she feels sorrow for the baby. Um, she set out to take this baby from our family. And we, we don't have that anymore. So 
as far as you know our future goes with Gabriel, there, there isn't one. So if she goes to jail, which I think she should, and she's removed from her family for a while, then maybe she will start to feel some of the pain that our family has felt. Um, I know my son wrote you a letter. Um, he based that upon his personal experience, the hardest thing for him to do um, in his life. And he couldn't do that without bad things happening to him. And that's why he wrote you that letter, because he was basing that on his personal experience and what he thought would be hard for Miss Smith. Um, my, my personal opinion, the rest opinion of our family, and his after I had an extensive conversation with him last night, and I, I told him I didn't think that you understood the perspective where he was coming from. So I, I told him I would speak about that today to you. Um, that's based upon what's happened to him in the last four years of his life and how difficult it's been for him. Um, he wants it to be that difficult for her. Um, so that she'll understand the pain that she caused here. Um, you know, I, I heard her say that uh, she thought God wanted her to have this baby. Well, over the mankind's history, a lot of terrible things have been done by people who used God's name to do those terrible things. And this is one of those terrible things. Um, I don't have anything more to say, sir. Let me ask you a question to make sure I understand what you just told me. I got a note from your son yes. telling me what he thought should happen. Yes. Are you telling me that that's not how he really feels now or that he's changed? Because I took that communication directly from him, um, and I'm going to assume that's how he feels absent something else. That That is, uh, to put it in, in perspective, my conversation with him, sir, um, that letter basically says... Probation is good because he couldn't complete probation. So he went back to jail a number of times because he couldn't do all those things required of him to complete his probation. And he's hopeful that that would be what happens with Miss Smith so that she will go back to jail a number of times for violating probation if you would give her probation so that this becomes an extended, long, drawn-out hardship for her. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Andrews. Your Honor, if possible, I would like to reserve my comments. I understand there are several people who are going to speak on the defendant's behalf, and I'd ask the court to allow me to reserve my comments until after they speak. My practice is, is that I want to hear from the state first before I hear from the defense or um, others that might be speaking on behalf of the defendant. Um, if you feel like there's something you must respond to afterwards, I'll hear you on it. My practice, though, is to allow you to speak to me now and then let the defense have a presentation and then make my decision. So I'm going to deny that request and ask that you tell me what you want to tell me now. Thank you, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, the photographs we put up there are photographs that Frank McQuarrie brought with him that he asked that we show the court. I have additional photographs that Gabriel's great aunt, Kelly, brought and asked that we also show the court. Your Honor, as I stand here before you today, um, I would imagine that there are several people who believe that the state knew what we were going to recommend for some time in this case. And i actually like to point out that that's actually not the case at all. In fact, well into last night, we still didn't know for sure what we were going to ask you for today. Um, we considered several different factors in this case, which included the letters we received from Gabriel's family, mm -hmm. the letters we received from the defense, the information we were already aware of as far as mitigation and aggravation, and the information that was provided to us. I'd like to first talk about the pre-sentence report recommendation. I was taken aback when I first read the pre-sentence report recommendation, which I didn't get until late yesterday afternoon into the evening. Um, the recommendation from the pre-sentence writer was two years probation on each count with mental health terms. 
But then I reviewed the pre-sentence report, and I, and I reviewed what the pre-sentence writer had to make his recommendation, and I don't think anybody can fault him for his recommendation because, frankly, as far as this case goes, he is the person who has the least amount of information. He wasn't here for the trial. He may not have even seen it on television like many people did. The state didn't provide sentencing comments to him because we were waiting on a ruling. The detective didn't provide sentencing comments. Logan McQuarrie didn't provide sentencing comments. The defendant didn't provide sentencing comments. So what the pre-sentence writer had was some letters from Gabriel McQuarrie's family and some information provided by the defense and a pre-sentence report that we provided to him with the police reports. But they didn't hear, he didn't hear the facts of this case. And so I'd like you to keep that in mind when you think about what the recommendation was from the pre-sentence writer. I want to talk about the victims in this case. As the court indicated, you only want to hear about interested parties, and that is, has been my intention to only talk to you about interested parties. Logan McQuarrie is the only statutory victim in this case. He's the only one listed as a victim on one of the counts in this case. However, the events in this case and the co-defendant's crimes certainly affected many people more than Logan McQuarrie, specifically Gabriel Johnson's family and friends were affected. And so what I wanted to talk to you about is the recommendations that they gave. Now, I know you read the letters that were contained in the pre-sentence report, and I have no doubt you read them quite thoroughly. I'd like to first talk about Logan McQuarrie. Um, and, and Mr. McQuarrie was talking to you, Frank McQuarrie was talking to you about Logan's recommendation. And the recommendation that you have before you is not one we have seen. Logan McQuarrie sent um, Frank McQuarrie an email, myself an email, and some other family members an email the other day. I don't believe that's the same email he sent you. You want to see it? And, and I can, Your Honor. I will tell you, though, I know that the victim's rights statute does not require that, that a victim's impact statement be disclosed. And for that reason, I, I don't want to put the defense in, in, in and disadvantage, but I will tell you what Logan McQuarrie originally recommended to us, what he originally wanted, and what he didn't understand this court was not going to be able to do, was to place Tammy Smith on probation and order $20,000 in restitution for her to pay back the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children so that that money could be used to find missing children. Now, in, in communicating with Logan McQuarrie, I informed him that's not the kind of restitution this court can order because that's not an actual causal loss from what occurred in this case. And so when I explained that to them, I mean, what Logan McQuarrie wanted to do is he wanted to do something that would cause the defendant to have to act, something that she would have be required to do. And if she wasn't going to pay that restitution, then she would seek she would face jail time. When I explained to Mr. McQuarrie that that's not how restitution work, he then sent a different letter to you and asked you for a different recommendation. I didn't get that different letter. You got the same the same letter about $20,000? I got one um, recommendation from Logan McQuarrie. It was via email forwarded by the probation department. If there's another one, I haven't seen it. And, and I haven't seen what necessarily what he forwarded by the probation department. But... He did, he did talk to Mr. McQuarrie, Frank McQuarrie, about sending a different letter after we talked to him about the restitution. He has not sent me one, so we're unclear on that. But it appears as though we have the same recommendation before us, and we wanted to explain that was the, what the recommendation was. And in talking to Frank McQuarrie, the reason Logan made that recommendation is because he himself has been on probation, and he found it to be extremely difficult for what he had gone through, and, and being able to comply with probation was difficult for Logan McQuarrie. And so he wanted the defendant to face that, that similar kind of consequences. And he wanted the defendant to face those consequences of that $20,000 restitution that also could be used to help other people. And in talking to him about restitution, obviously that's not something the court's going to be able to do. But we talked about the other family members and, and what they're asking for. And you can tell from the letters that they were asking for the maximum sentence. And essentially, the maximum sentence would be if you took both counts and, and ran them consecutively and gave the defendant prison for each count. Um, 
and what they're asking for, and like I said, I know you've read the letters, but there are certain things that I looked at because I had to decide what recommendation the state was going to make, looking at what Logan wants and what the family members look. Some of the things that I considered when they wrote the letters were statements like from Aunt Sandy Peters, who is Gabriel's great aunt, said that Tammy has never apologized to Logan for her involvement and doesn't appear to believe she did anything wrong. The only way to get Tammy to understand the magnitude of her actions is to keep her from repeating them, is to lock her up for a while, and to get her the counseling she needs. The family has watched Logan as the story unfolded, making his way through a broken heart, asking for the time for him and his family members who have spent so many hours in tears and fear searching for our baby. Aunt Kelly and... and for the court's information, the Aunt Kelly is Gabriel's great aunt. She's been in the courtroom several times for this case. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the family members who have not been in the courtroom. Uh, Logan McQuarrie, Gabriel Johnson had family members all the way across the country who have been watching this case on television and on the internet who are currently watching it as we speak. And unfortunately, they haven't been here to sit in the courtroom for you to see how many people have been affected by it, which is why they wrote the letters. But these, but Aunt Kelly lives here in the Valley and she has been here in the court several times and she wrote the court a letter. But she stated that while the Smiths talked about losing their Mercedes and their big beautiful home, we have lost so much more. We have lost this beautiful blue eyed blonde haired little boy who had this big beautiful smile and brought so much joy to many of us. Talks about the night the investigators wanted a timeline. I'm sorry, she talks about the night the investigators wanted a timeline and Logan stayed up all night on his computer doing the timeline and crying hard. And, and she talks about, and Logan talked about this at trial too, is every time he sees another little boy wondering if that little boy could be his son. Gabriel's great grandmother, Charlotte Smith, said that Tammy Smith has torn the heart out of this family piece by piece. She was and is only thinking of what she wants. In doing this, she does not deserve to have what she wants. She deserves to have a sentence that will give her the time to think of many things she did to hurt others and to be where she is not allowed to be with family or friends. Gabriel's great aunt, Jerry Beeson Nichols, said it's unacceptable that Mrs. Smith be given anything less than the full sentence for her involvement in actions in the disappearance of our nephew, Gabriel. Jessica Tafola, who is a family friend, said, I urge you to remember when making your decision what this is all about. This is about a beautiful blonde haired blue eyed boy named Gabriel Scott Johnson. This is about two women who would do anything to keep Gabriel away from his father. This is about a father that wakes up and goes to bed every day thinking of his son and wondering where he is and will he ever see him again. Nicola Vest Verstigen said that Tammy has, she's a family friend as well, she said, Tammy has blamed everyone, but takes no responsibility for her own actions. She calls witnesses liars, jurors, bullies, and continues to hide behind her religion. And Patricia Wright, who's also a family friend, said, I think Mrs. Tammy Smith is never going to accept responsibility for her actions if she gets probation. She needs to go to prison to learn that you cannot commit crimes and walk away scot-free. She has never shown remorse and probably never will. And then Laurel Coughlin, who is also a family friend, says she still does not see herself as guilty of any wrongdoing, but instead has deemed herself a savior of women in trouble. And then, Your Honor, I know you heard from Frank McQuarrie, but he and I also had a conversation about what he would like us to ask for. And in the conversation, he said to me, I know that the other family members want the maximum sentence, but what he thinks is fair, what he thinks is is appropriate is a prison sentence of three and a half years followed by probation or parole. And so, Your Honor, in addition to the information provided by the victims and the victim's family, we looked at the mitigation, and, and the defense did provide significant mitigation. And none of it was a surprise to the state. It was all information we had previously had, but we read through it carefully. Um, we know and we've known from day one that Tammy Smith never intended harm for Gabriel Johnson. She never intended that. And we know that she didn't intend for him to be permanently missing. We know that. That was never her intention. We know that she has a significant prior personal history. We, of course, can't verify that information, but we don't doubt that some of it exists, if not all of it. She certainly, I believe, has mental health issues that can be addressed. But then, Your Honor, we also had to go back and look into the defendant's own actions. And 
we have to separate this defendant from the co-defendant because while they acted together, certainly Elizabeth Johnson acted separately to put us in a different position than we may have been. But in looking at the defendant's actions, this is what we looked at. This was not the first time Tammy Smith believed she could manipulate the system to get a child at any cost. She had wanted to use Deanne's husband's sperm. She was advertising for surrogacy when her own husband didn't apparently know about it. She was looking for military wives for their insurance. She was looking into surrogates in California to avoid the Arizona laws. There was Rachel Hoover, who was a young mother who was desperately looking for her home for a baby. But as soon as Rachel Hoover wanted to use her own attorney, that whole adoption process went sour. Tammy could no longer control the situation. Tammy Smith talked about Elizabeth Johnson being manipulative. I have absolutely no doubt that, that Elizabeth Johnson is manipulative. I think it's very clear from the facts that we heard in this trial that she can be very manipulative, and she certainly didn't manipulate Logan McQuarrie. But at the same time, it's hard to understand how Tammy Smith could have been so manipulated by Elizabeth Johnson, but for her own wishes and desires in this case. Tammy Smith is an intelligent businesswoman. She has run several businesses. She talked about traveling to other countries as a missionary. She's already a mother before this case ever began. In this case, she's, she was used to taking control, and she attempted to control Elizabeth Johnson. When the defendant first met Elizabeth, she talked about Logan not being in the picture. And certainly, if that's exactly how this case played out from the beginning to the end, it may have been a whole different case. But in this, in this case, she found out that Logan was not only in the picture, but very much involved in the picture and objecting to what Tammy Smith wanted to do. Essentially, she didn't stop when she was told to stop. She didn't stop when her own lawyer told her that she couldn't adopt Gabriel if Logan didn't agree. Instead, she withheld information from that lawyer. She misled that lawyer, and then she, stood, she sat in this trial and claimed it was his bad advice were the reasons that she completed her actions. She didn't stop when she learned from police that Elizabeth had lied to them about Gabriel's whereabouts on December 9, 2009. She didn't stop when she lied to CPS, and she told Alicia Shumway that she was only babysitting Gabriel while Elizabeth looked for a job, even though Gabriel was staying with her and they were looking into adoption. She didn't stop when she watched CPS confront Elizabeth about lying about the adoption. She didn't stop when CPS told her that Logan had filed for custody. And she didn't stop when CPS told her to butt out of the custody battle. She didn't stop when she marched that same day right down to the courthouse with Elizabeth and filed false court paperwork. She didn't stop when her best friend Deanne questioned what she was doing. She didn't stop when she learned there was a court order for Logan to have Gabriel. In fact, she tried to find another way around that court order. She didn't stop when she took Gabriel to see Santa Claus and when she changed his name to Jacob during the nine days that she had him. She didn't stop when she learned Elizabeth fled to Texas. She didn't stop when she tried to get Elizabeth to go even further away to Tennessee and to hide where Tammy and her husband had significant ties. She didn't stop when she learned that Elizabeth had said that she had killed Gabriel. She didn't stop when she told Logan that he needed to sign adoption papers so that Gabriel would come home. And she didn't stop when the police gave her significant opportunities to come clean and tell them what was going on. But instead, she told lie after lie and placed blame on anyone and everyone she could but herself. She still doesn't stop to this day, even after a jury has found her guilty. She and her husband have instead tried to start a charity for pregnant single women called Stones of Grace. She didn't stop when she blames the jury for the verdict, the police, and the prosecutors for her conviction. She hasn't stopped when after everything that Gabriel's family has lost, she complains about her own monetary losses. She doesn't stop when she talks about losing everything and having to put her cars up for collateral, the Mercedes, the Lexus, and the Humvee. She never talks about the time 
the, the, the financial cost on Logan, the time he wasn't working when he was looking for the baby, the, the expense that he would have suffered if he came here to Arizona every day to watch the trial or even to be here at sentencing because the county attorney's office is not allowed to pay for those types of things. She doesn't stop when she talks about the harassment from the media and the public. Now, nobody deserves harassment from the media and the public. But when this case began, when this was a media release, it was to find Gabriel Johnson. That's what this was presented in the, in the media for. Tammy and Jack Smith were a very small part of the case. The police weren't really interested in them other than what information they had to help them find Gabriel Johnson. But it was their own regular and continual appearances on TV that put them in the limelight, that invited the media, that invited the public into their lives. And then while doing so, they continued to publicly disparage Logan even after they claimed that they had misinformation from Elizabeth Johnson. Logan didn't put them out there in the media and the public. Elizabeth didn't put them out there in the media and the public. The police didn't put them out there in the media and the public. Tammy and Jack Smith put themselves out there. And it was Tammy Smith's repeated lies, misrepresentations, and withholding information that caused the police to return time after time to her door. In one of the postings provided to you by a friend, of Logan McQueary and the letters attached to the pre-sentence report, Tammy talks about how prosecutors can sleep when they send innocent people to jail or prison. Well, first of all, a jury has determined that she's not an innocent person, that she's guilty of these two crimes. But I can state on behalf of this prosecution team that we don't put innocent people in jail or prison. And we certainly don't take the responsibility of asking for jail or prison lightly. It's something we think about a great deal and we look at everything carefully. But we also don't sleep very well at night. What keeps us up at night is the same thing that kept Gabriel's family up at night. Phone calls in December of 2009 saying a mother said she had killed her young son. What keeps us up at night is when a person will stop at no cost to take a baby who doesn't belong to her against the wishes of his father and his family. What keeps us up at night is watching on TV or hearing in calls that the defendant who seemed to care very little about this missing child that she supposedly loved instead was more interested in telling her family and friends about how Nancy Gracia was gonna offer her a job and how the media wanted to talk to her and how she was gonna write a book. What keeps us up at night, Your Honor, is waiting with bated breath the phone call about the progress of a landfill search or the follow-up on yet another lead that led us to nowhere. What keeps me up at night is when I go home and look at my same seven-month-old son with blonde hair and blue eyes and a gorgeous smile, and I think of Gabriel Johnson every time. And I ask myself, what have we missed? What did we forget? Where didn't we look? And how can I, as a humble prosecutor, bring justice to Gabriel Johnson? And, Your Honor, all I can do is stand before you and weigh the mitigation, which I have, and weigh the aggravation. Consider what the family members have asked. Consider the requests of Logan and his friends. And to balance retribution with rehabilitation and to ask for a sentence that takes into account this defendant's own actions that led to Gabriel Johnson being missing today. And Your Honor, what we're asking for today is for the defendant to be sentenced to the Department of Corrections on count two for the presumptive term of two and a half years. We are also asking the defendant on count one receive the maximum probation tail of four years with the following probation terms. We'd ask the court retain jurisdiction over restitution because in conversing with Logan McQuarrie about what restitution this court can actually order, we think there may be a request in the future. <clears throat> We'd ask for mental health terms. It's what the probation department asks. We think there's sufficient information that at least she should be screened for mental health terms. We are asking this court to order that the defendant have no care, custody, and control over minor children except for her own or her legally adopted children. 
and we were asking the court to order that she not be allowed to profit from any book, publications, or appearances in this case. And, Your Honor, Ms. Ramunu has done the research on that last request, and we have case law available if the court needs it. You can't order that the defendant not write publications or not make appearances, but the case law is pretty clear. You can order that she cannot profit from them. So, Your Honor, we'd ask you to consider what we've said today and sentence the defendant as we ask. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Yes, Judge. Um, just to give you a heads up, on my request for the first uh, witness that we'd like to call. Okay, that's the first witness? Yes. Okay, the, the defense is, is um, going to call or ask a person to speak on Ms. Smith's behalf. There's been a request not to um, show that person on camera. Um, I'm going to respect that request as best we can. There's no problem with the audio, so I'm giving everybody a heads up that we're going to not... Um, show this first speaker and the first speaker only uh, on camera. I'm a little hesitant to do that, but under the circumstances, I'm going, going to um, allow that request. And Judge, defense is going to ask that uh, Reverend Ernest Spears be allowed to address the court. Okay, Reverend Spears, come on up. Good afternoon. Hello, sir. What would you like to tell me? Well, I just to, uh, wrote some bullet points here to keep focused on what I'm doing. And um, I appreciate you allowing the camera deal. If it's necessary, we can go with that. But uh, as my position in the state of California and Nevada, as I'm over a number of churches and things, and I just do not have to deal with this as my job as a minister uh, every place I go. But I'm here this uh, afternoon to speak of my relationship with Tammy, which began some 12, 13 years ago when she came into the life of my uh, brother-in-law, Jack Smith. And um, we, being in California, they being in Tennessee, our acquaintance and our time together personally were uh, usually cut down to two weeks a year where we spent on vacation and with them, plus the time that we spent on the phone and talking with but every time that I had met with her and we began to get acquainted with Tammy and talk to her, uh, being a, a pastor seemed to lead us to the point of late nights conversation and talks uh, going into the Bible. Both, mostly comes out of her uh, reaching for help and understanding of her background, things that she came out of and things that had happened in her and uh, questions that was asking. We would uh, talk quite extensively scripturally and um, try to give advice to her how to handle certain situations in her life and how to go on from where she was at and how to make some positive steps. Uh, as we begin to talk and share, it becomes increasingly clear Tammy's uh, desire began to be that uh, of caring and helping people and especially uh, mothers or those with children who maybe had some of the same problems and difficulties she had in the separation of her children and so forth um, to the talking and uh, of how to help those mothers and creating um, a venue that they would be safe where they would have somebody that would care for them and uh, she could reach out. Uh, in those talks of doing that, I, I shared with her uh, those are great desires and aspirations to make. I also uh, made some counsel uh, to, to be careful how we do that, uh, how fast we start and how big we're going. Uh, I serve uh, as an executive presbyter. I'm over a large region, 98 churches, and um, uh, I have a lot of responsibility for Northern California, State of Nevada, and Teen Challenge uh, Center. So I understand the process, the amount of money, what goes into that. So my counsel to her was step back, slow down, and understand that when you go into these, there's a lot more than just reaching out to help. 
there's laws and regulations that must be aware of uh, to make sure that you go through the proper s steps to do that. Uh, uh, also be concerned about funding. It's more than just starting off with a package. Uh, the difficulty is keeping them funding because uh, they're more of a missions project because it required basically on donations and things. Once you get started, you want to be able to keep it uh, going. So my counsel was to, to, instead of looking so large, bring it back down, follow your dreams, but make sure that you keep in front of you what is required, inspecting that you do it properly. And, uh, and so that become our talking and she would share it with us on those type of things. I also uh, encouraged her at all times to never lose sight of her vision, but uh, as my counsel is with all of my ministers, and is to keep one foot on the ground, too, with the reality and understand what is uh, in, uh, expected of you, what is there before you, so that when you look for your vision, you still keep reality and checked and understand and know that and to do that. Um, one of the things I have found out uh, in knowing Tammy over these uh, number of years is um, she has a big heart caring uh, and uh, reaches out and I've never seen her, her in that time uh, to be vindictive with somebody other than reaching out and, and maybe even overextending herself to help people uh, that she would do. I, uh, I know that she has done her best to educate herself in these areas to get uh, more knowledge to be able to how to help and assist people to more training in her behalf to be able to help and follow the visions uh, that she has. I, I believe one of the things that Tammy has always been and seemed to me as a very caring person. Um, also in that uh, council has been that be careful uh, how you do that to make sure that you've got your feet on the ground, understand what you're doing when you reach out and care for somebody. I also believe that um, as a loving and caring person as she is, that there are times that um, uh, that is, has caused her to even to be taken advantage of in situations that I'm aware of outside of this uh, bearing, but that um, I, I think uh, one of the hardest things I find even with my fellow ministers that, I'm, that I interview and everything is keeping in check a vision, that they have that in check, but also to have reality and to understand the cost involved in what's around you. And so our counsel with that, and I believe with that, her heart has been one that has been to care for people, to love for people, and uh, to reach out when possible. And uh, I believe from my involvement talking to her, that's been what has driven her, and it still does today, is to be able somehow to help people that, uh, because of what she has experienced in her own life at times. So. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the defense will ask that the court allow Reverend James Pryor to address the court. Okay. Reverend Pryor, come on up. Okay, hang on one second. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Thank you for hearing my words. What would you like to tell me? I am a ordained minister and pastor at Phoenix First Assembly of God Church. I am not a professional counselor. I am not a psychotherapist, psychologist. I do not per, um, portray myself to be that. I'm a pastor, but that uh, provides pastoral counseling. That is the majority of my job at the church, to provide biblical counseling. Uh, Tammy has come in to see me on numerous occasions. Um, she has presented herself to be a very kind-hearted, caring person, and I believe her to be the type of person that will always look out for someone else before herself, and that she always looks out for those that are downtrodden, those that are hurting, those, that, those people in society that um, maybe other people overlook. She's always been the type of person to reach out to them and to help them. In my understanding of the law um, of, this, of this great country is that we always, always take into consideration intent. And I wanted to talk to you just about what Tammy is, how she, her intent is always to help other people. 
And she has always been there as a person that not only will sacrifice who she is and what she has, but she will do it at a great cost to herself, that she will do this at a great cost to herself. And, and Your Honor, I'm going to keep it brief because I know we have a lot of other people that want to speak. All I want to ask you, sir, is that as you consider your, your decision today, that you would to take into consideration that Tammy does do what she does because she is guided by her heart, not always by her head, but by her heart, and that you would take into consideration justice, but also mercy and temper it with mercy, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can I have just one moment, Your Honor? Sure. Jerry, come on up. Good afternoon. What would you like to tell me? Um, Tammy Smith, my cousin. Um, I've known her my entire life. She, um, like the pastor just said, she is guided by her heart for the most part. And she, I guess, pretty much got swept away in things that were going on. Um, she is a very loving and caring person, mother, wife. Um... I guess that's that's pretty much it. Just I've always thought of her as just an amazing woman, and for all that she's been through, her childhood, even her early adulthood, um, for her to get to where she's at now is pretty amazing. With these unfortunate events that's been occurring for the last two and a half years, I don't know. She still, you know, stayed very, very strong. It begs the question, why me? And she's never asked that question of herself. Um, but. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. No problem. You know, we're going to ask that Benjamin Taylor, he's attorney Benjamin Taylor, who represents Jack Smith, just briefly address the court. Uh, and then we're going to have Jack Smith address the court, which should be finished. Okay. Mr. Taylor, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. What would you like to tell him? Yes, on behalf of Jack Smith and on behalf of the family, um, Throughout this trial, I've had an opportunity to get to know Ms. Tammy Smith and Jack Smith a lot better. Tammy has a loving heart. I've had dinner with the family. I've been to their job. And the clients at her job love Tammy. Her kids love Tammy. She's an excellent and wonderful mom. And as you know, Your Honor, I've appeared in front of your court. I've appeared in front of other courts. And these type of charges are first-time offenses eligible for probation. So on behalf of Jack Smith, he's asking for, and we're asking for, that you sentence Miss Tammy Smith to probation with no jail. He'll, Mr. Smith will be speaking after me, but this it's very rare that you see a person like Tammy Smith in your courtroom who has gone on a mission, who is Christian, and has a lot of positive attributes. A lot of people we represent don't have those type of attributes to give to the court, but Miss Tammy Smith does. So we ask you, to give her probation, no jail time, because this is the type of offense, these type of counts deserve probation and no jail. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Judge. What would you like to tell me? <clears throat> I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, I, I met Tammy. Uh, about 14 years ago, I had one of the sweetest smiles and the biggest, uh, biggest laughs that there was and that I'd ever seen. Uh, she came to work in my business, and um, much of my business depended at that point on customer service, um, being able to talk, and she's uh, quite the talker, as you've uh, seen so far. Um, and um, I had, at that point, lost pretty much the eye of the tiger. Um, she, um, shortly after uh, becoming our sales, jumped 30% from her being able to talk like she did and, and our, uh, it became very successful and my business uh, was much better because of Tammy. Um, 
And even though we come from different generations, we fell in love, decided to get married. Um, my children fought her being a part of my life because of the age and the, because they hadn't had time to, to get to know the real Tammy. Um, uh, through the love and, and persever perseverance uh, toward them, she became best friends with my children. Um, and then when circumstances beyond our control uh, with my grandchildren, um, potentially not being in a, a safe situation, she became mommy uh, to them. Um, and my family through that became uh, better because of Tammy. And through the trials with her own children, um, she never gave up. She fought um, with every ounce of strength that she had to show them the love uh, that her mother, uh, that their mother desperately wanted to be a part of their lives. And uh, even though she was being falsely accused of things and, and driven, wedges driven between them and the children, uh, the children are, are now actually a, a much better because Tammy is a part of their life. Um, uh, I, I can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, we've, we've heard a lot here today about, about the giving heart. Uh, but I want to give you a, <clears throat> I want to give you an example. Um, as recent as the fourth of July, we were out for uh, going to go out for a family time. Uh, she said, "Pull in here, pull in here." So I pulled into the Seven Eleven. She jumped out and um, got uh, a banana and uh, some water and a snack and said, "Go back that way." And I went back and she said, "Okay, turn around." I turned around. And there sat a gentleman on a bench um, with no shoes. Um, his underwear was drying on the edge of the basket that I'm assuming that he uh, took from one of the stores around there. And um, she jumped out and gave him something to eat and told him how much God loved him. Um, I, I, the world is a better place because of Tammy being in it. I, I, I honestly don't, I, I can't comprehend what mine and my children's life would be out with without her. I can't, be, I can't imagine what it would be like. Um, I'm asking that you uh, look deep in your heart. Uh, I know this is, I don't envy you, you're having to make this decision. But I'm asking you to, to look deep in your heart and, uh, and make the right decision. And that would be uh, allowing my wife to go home with me today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Here I take it back. We do have one more. I, I thought that uh, Miss Smith's sister did not want to address the court, but uh, she does. Bobby Peters would like to address the court briefly. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What would you like to tell me? Um, I just wanted to tell you that I love my sister dearly. She does have a very kind heart. Uh, my nieces are going to need her. She helps many people. Um, this whole thing has put a burden on everybody. Um, I just feel I would like to request that you are lenient on her and that she is able to um, be able to go home with her children today. Um, I'm not a very good speaker. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, but I ask you to be lenient on her, Judge. Thank, Thank you. you. Here, Ms. Smith would like to address the court, and then I'd like to follow it up with some comments and recommendations about sentencing. Okay. Ms. Smith, what would you like to tell me? Well, I, I wrote a speech here because it, I thought about some things, but I figured I would my emotions would get the best of me and I would forget what I needed to say. So, um, I just want to, one thing I do want to say that wasn't on my speech though was about what I heard the prosecutor say. But they don't want me to say. <laughs> so, I'm just going to read my speech to you. Your Honor, I stand here before you a humble servant of God. I'm sure that you've heard all kinds of things about me, whether they're good or bad. I know you've heard from the prosecution and their witnesses, and I'm sure you've read many letters from many people. And I'm sure most of them are people who don't even know me, yet they pass judgment on me based on what they've been fed, fed through the Internet and media. 
You might have even heard some of the media stories that sold airtime or newspapers. <clears throat> but you really don't know me. And at this time, I just, I want to introduce myself. And for the very first time, if you and everyone would please get to know me, the real me. And my name is Tammy Peters Smith. I'm a 40-year-old mother. I'm a wife. I'm a businesswoman. And I'm a bond servant of God. I am a Christian. And I've been a growing Christian since I was 11 years old. I am a giver. And I wanted to find a Christian so that you can understand me better. Because a Christian is what defines me as a person. Being a Christian is in every aspect of who I am and what I do. Somebody saying that they're a Christian does not make them a Christian. <clears throat> Being a Christian does not, <clears throat> does not make you better than anyone, doesn't make you worse than anyone. A Christian is not somebody who goes to church every Sunday or a couple times a week for that matter. A Christian is somebody that has given their life over to Jesus Christ, somebody who lives their life for Jesus Christ. A Christian is being Christ-like. And to be Christ-like means to be like Christ. A Christian is someone who actually lives their life for him and lives their life like him. <clears throat> Three of the most important things to me being Christ-like is to love others, to serve others, and to forgive others. <clears throat> the greatest of these is love. Treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself. And I live by that every day of my life. If you read throughout the Bible, you'll find that these three things were important to Jesus as well. You also find that Jesus loved everyone, even his enemies. He helped everyone and served everyone especially his enemies. Jesus forgave anyone who asked for forgiveness, and he still does. Jesus was innocent, yet he was judged and found guilty. So they nailed him to a cross through his hands and through his feet, and they beat him, and they stabbed him on his side, and they, they put a crown of thorns on his head, forced it on his head and they mocked them. They mocked him while he died and, and as he as he hung there dying, he begged for forgiveness of those people. He prayed for forgiveness and he said in Luke 23, 34, please forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And I'm here to tell you today that it is very hard to be Christ-like all of the time, especially when you're going through something like this and you know the truth yourself. Not that I am going through even a tenth of what Jesus went through, not even close, but I think in these two and a half years' time, with what I have gone through and how I've been punished by these people, I might know just slightly what Jesus was thinking possibly when he hung on that cross. For two and a half years now, my husband and I have been judged guilty by these people. These people have punished me, my family, and my company for things we didn't do. All of this judgment and punishment has been happening by certain people hiding behind fake profiles over the internet. They are very happy for what they've done to us. And because of what they've done, it has nearly destroyed our company and has caused us to nearly lose everything we've worked so hard for nearly 14 years. What they don't know, though, is that we have not lost each other and we have not lost our faith in God. But because of what they've done to us, it has made our marriage and our faith in God grow stronger. I never realized until all of this happened and we started getting attacked by these people on the internet and phone calls and emails and, and, and attacking our, our business, you know, our websites and, the, and 
literally for the world to see, to try to destroy our business. In these two and a half years, I've realized that there's not many people out there that truly, truly know Jesus Christ. And my heart breaks every day for those people. They really don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. I baptized people in Africa, and those people didn't know Jesus either. But they also didn't know what a car looked like when we drove up six hours out of civilization. They had heard about this thing with wheels and people were on it. They had never seen one though. And so my heart breaks for those people who have hurt us. I have been mocked and ridiculed by these people for being a Christian, and more sadly than that, our Lord and Savior has been mocked for having me as a child of God. I have forgiven those enemies. I forgive all my enemies. I pray for them as God wants me to, and I have not wished evil or harm on them as they continue to do to me, and I will continue to pray for them forever, for they know not what they do. And when they call me and say evil things to me, I pray for them or I recite John 3.16. And just like God did for Daniel, he closes their mouths. And Your Honor, I have closed my mouth for two and a half years. Yes, I spoke to the media for, I don't know, a couple weeks or whatever in the beginning because I thought, I thought I was helping. That's what the media told me, that I was helping to find a baby. That's what we wanted to do. But I, I've never been able to tell the whole story of what really happened, the true story, because I have never been allowed that chance. But I can assure you, my heart breaks and it bleeds for all of those who have been hurt. And I'm very sorry for any pain or any suffering that helping this young woman in need may have caused somebody, whether intentional or not, or unintentional. I never intended to hurt anybody. I intended to help people. And I'm sorry for the pain it caused the McQuarrie family, the Johnson family, and even the Smith family, as well as all of the people that have heard about this case and prayed for that poor child. I pray every day that Gabriel is alive and that he is found, and wherever he is, that he is safe and being loved. I'm sure those words will be twisted in 10 minutes on the internet as they always do, as always everything I say. <clears throat> but I am a Christian and I have only love for those people. Whether they played a part in the situation, whether it be innocent or by deceiving this court somehow throughout this case, I love them and I will continue to pray for them forever. And I just want you to know that we were handed Gabriel by a mother in need two and a half years ago. And we held that precious baby in our arms for nine days and took good care of him. And I know, I knew by the second day she didn't, she didn't want to give her baby away. I knew that because she called me constantly and wanted me to bring the baby to see her. So I held her hand through it, thinking I was doing the right thing for a mother that wanted to keep custody of her child. I would love to stand here today and tell you what really happened, but I can't. I've, I've basically been warned not to talk about this case, so I won't. But what's most important to me is that God knows the truth. He knows what really happened, and that's what's most important to me. And, Your Honor, I am also not going to stand here and beg for probation only. Like I said, I am a Christian. I can serve God no matter where I am or who I am with, and I will do it with grace. Because of this, I have learned not to help single mothers anymore without the umbrella of a strong foundation and a 5013C that can back me so that I can properly help young mothers and children. And I ask that you don't take that away from me because I can help so many people in so many ways, knowing that I will have that foundation and I will have people 
that have already gone through this and know how to do it correctly. I will have them behind me and we will have the proper people in place to be able to do this and help mothers and children. And part of my website, if you were to see it, Your Honor, you would notice in there that I am not taking donations at this time. You will also notice in there, Your Honor, that we help the single mothers to have a co-existence with the father of their child when legally applicable. A jury has found me guilty, and it is your job to punish me. And I believe that God will put it in your heart to see through all the lies that have been told about me. And I know he will help you to see the truth and only the truth so that you can make a decision based on the truth and who I really am. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, if I may, I, I know the court's read uh, the sentencing memo we provided to the court. I'll probably cover a little bit of that ground, but not all of it. Um, I, it took me, I think, maybe two weeks into the trial um, before my jaded defense attorney shell got cracked a little bit. Um, I've done this for the last 12 years. Um, I've heard a lot. I've seen a lot. Uh, I've dealt with some very difficult, hardened people. And, and you start to get a bit jaded. And it took me a while. Um, but I think maybe two weeks into trial, I started to see things differently. I started to see Tammy differently. I started to have a, a, maybe a new perspective on her and who she was and began to realize that, you know, even I, uh, her attorney, had been affected by some of the things that had been said by her, about her. You just can't help it. It's out there constantly. When you look at it, the news media, the reports, all of the things that have been said about her. And I don't know that there are any of us could stand up to that. I don't know that any of us would want to stand up to that. That constant drumbeat of making it Tammy out to be a villain. And she's not. She just isn't. And, and I, I realize why. And I realize the psychology of doing it. And I realize why people want her to be a villain. Because if she's a villain, then Gabriel's alive. If she's a villain, then Gabriel's safe somewhere. But the reality is he's not. There is a villain in this, and that's Elizabeth Johnson. I believe her when she said she killed him. There is a villain here. And one thing that we know about Tammy Smith is that she would not harm a hair on that child's head. She did not want that. She would never want that. Now, it's the last thing that Tammy would want. And we know, and it's uncontroverted, that Tammy had nothing to do with Elizabeth Johnson leaving the state. Tammy never left Arizona. She was here the whole time. Now, do I think Tammy's way of trying to get Elizabeth to come back was wise? No, probably not. And, and you've seen the reports, and, and you've, I think, maybe given some, uh, some unique insight into her through what we've provided to the courts. However, one thing I can tell you about her is that she had no malice in her heart then. She doesn't have it now. Of all the people that are involved in this and the personal players, the attorneys, uh, the family, the friends, she's been the one accepting of the verdict. She's been the one accepting of whatever happens to her. She'll live with everybody else is, is stunned and upset can't imagine that there's a possibility she might go to prison, but Tammy has been the one that's been stoic about it. And I'm certainly not going to ask if that's what you do, but I want you to know who it is on this side who's been accepting of this, and she's been framed differently. And it's just not the case. The framing of who Tammy is is just not the case. The framing of, of falsehoods are just not the case. I think we all want to look at the picture up there. Everybody does because he's a cute baby. And he's got blue eyes and nice features. Everybody wants to believe that he's alive, but he's not. Everybody wants to leave his beautiful mother 
could not have killed him, but she did. And she's the villain here. She's a beautiful woman, and she's fooled a lot of people. If you sat through the trial, and we can list who she's fooled. She fooled Logan, most and first and foremost. She fooled Tammy. It's pretty clear from the recordings we heard that she fooled Detective Ramirez. It's pretty clear from the recordings we heard that she fooled the county attorney's office, that she fooled her own attorneys. Everybody thought, at least at one point, that Tammy Smith had set up an underground adoption and that she'd passed off this child to some unknown parties. It just didn't happen. Sometimes in life we have to accept difficult things. This is one of those times. She fooled everyone. Tammy's the one being prosecuted for being fooled. Should she have acted in every manner the way she did? Was it wise? Probably not. Was it well-meaning? It was. Was there malice in her heart? There was not. I genuinely believe that when she says that these were ideas she, had came, she came up with to get Elizabeth Johnson to return to the state and that they were desperate to get her to return is the case. I want to talk a little bit about Stones of Grace. And people have kind of spun that into something that it isn't. This, this foundation and this idea precedes this case. Uh, and this was something that Tammy wanted to set up, and we explained a little bit about that in our memorandum to the court. And I asked Tammy, Tammy, why Stones of Grace? What, what's, why, what's the purpose of the name? And, and she related to me the story of the woman caught in adultery taken before Jesus Christ. And her accusers surrounded her, and knowing the law at the time, uh, knowing the Old Testament law at the time, she should have been stoned to death for that. But instead, um, Jesus Christ asked them, <coughs> whoever does, yeah, yeah, I, I'm getting that. She, she, does, she doubts me. <laughs> he asked them, that any of you without <coughs> sin, you be the first one to throw the stone. Of course, he being the only one there without sin. And they all left. And she was left alone. And he told her to go her way. She views, I think, herself, given her past, in much the same light that she views these single mothers. She views herself, given the abuse that she's gone through, as scorned. She views herself as somebody that people look down on. And it precedes this case. She's gone through a lot of abuse. She's lost her children. And she sees those stones that the men dropped at the feet of the woman taken in adultery as, as little stones of grace and of mercy. And I think truly that Tammy Smith, through it all, and when you see her actions and, and how she, what she does in life, the charitable service she provides, the help to the strangers she provides, She's seeking for redemption. I think she's seeking for redemption for her past. She's got a lot of memories that she can't let go of. She's got a lot of abuse that she can't let go of. She's got three children that she lost in a court battle. She's taken on uh, two children, one with fetal alcohol syndrome, that are, were, I guess, granddaughters of Jack, and now they're children, and willing to raise those children as, as her own. She has endured, as she mentioned, and I don't, I don't know that I see it the same way that the prosecutor sees it. She has endured countless personal attacks. She sent me emails, even including today, and I, I thought I wasn't going to have to address this because the court said that the non-family members that it wasn't going to consider, but even today, uh, she was represented. I don't think she, I, I, I don't know. I, I did some research letters on the people who were non-family members that were included in the pre-sentence report. It appears to me that these are all Facebook-type friends. Could be wrong, but that's what it appears <laughs> to me. Again, today, uh, Nicola Verst Verstigen, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, sent a, comment, sent a comment directly to Tammy. And this was at 11.13 a.m., at least that's when it was sent to me. People have gotten Jack's phone number asked him to leave Tammy, to leave his wife and move on. 
people call the business. People call her and ask for religious advice after she's talked to them for a while. They tell her, well, you've been had. And this has been constant for two years. And it continues to today. And I thought about what recommendation should I make to the court. And I, I'm going to change a little bit of the recommendation I made in my, in, my pre, in my memo to the court. What should I recommend? And I thought, well, what do we normally see? And Mr. Taylor talked a little bit about that. Typically, on a case like this, with no priors, somebody who's lived the life and had the professional accomplishments that Tammy has, uh, we'd see probation. We'd see probation without jail. And I thought, are there some... Are there some cases that we can point to where that's happened? And it occurred to me there's a case that came up in this case that we talked about in direct testimony. And I looked at it, and, and I, it seems that there's been a lot of people spent a lot of time trying to talk Logan into a different recommendation, although I haven't seen what he wrote. And it sounds like there's been some effort into talking him into something else. Now, Logan had a case. He had three different felony charges with three different victims. Um, he was offered a plea agreement in his case. Tammy was never offered a plea agreement. Uh, in his case, he pled guilty to a Class 6 Open. Tammy did not receive the benefit of a Class 6 Open and a Class 5. Uh, in his case, he was out of custody on his own recognizance. In Tammy's case, She's been out on $24,000 bond, but she has been out. Uh, in his case, um, there was a 703 allegation, multiple offenses. In Tammy's case, there was a 703 allegation of multiple offenses. In his case, there were aggravating factors alleged by the, case, uh, the state, uh, in particular, financial and emotional harm done to the victim. In Tammy's case, that same aggravator was alleged. Now, Logan took advantage of the state, of the offer that the state gave him. Now, when he went to sentencing, he was sentenced to three years of supervised probation, and we will ask that Tammy be sentenced to three years of supervised probation. Uh, now, he was given 80 hours of community super... He was, he, getting past myself. He was given 80 hours of community service, and we will ask that Tammy be given 80 hours of community service. He was not given any initial jail. And we will ask that Tammy not be given any initial jail. I looked up the recommendation, and this is in the 2004 case that was talked about on direct. I looked up the recommendation from the county attorney's office. And their recommendation was for three years of supervised probation. Uh, and they recommended that he get six months of deferred jail not up front jail. So again, we would ask that if the court's inclined to give Ms. Smith probation and include jail as a term that it be deferred. Um, I, also, there was another felony count, you know, the class three, that came up in the middle of this particular case. Um, it was a victim case. Um, Logan was given a misdemeanor theft in that case and unsupervised probation. And we're not going to ask for that. But what we are going to ask is that the court take into consideration what happened here. Tammy, in a million years, would not have dreamed that any of this would happen, nor did she desire that any of this happen. She's here as a professional woman with many accomplishments. And I, and I gave you a list of what I thought were mitigating <coughs> factors. She's here as somebody who has put herself out and willing to talk to the court, even though they have put a lot of effort into saying the way she lives her life and her views on life are, are just wrong. Tammy, I can tell you from dealing with her, I went down with her. I sat with her and her family at McDonald's. Little kids ran around. I watched her interaction with them. She's a good and caring mother. Do we want Gabriel Johnson back? We do. We all do. But he can't come back. There's a villain here. It's Elizabeth Johnson. 
Her trial is coming. Tammy's not that person. Did she make some poor decisions? Yes. But I'd ask you sentence her in parity with other defendants that come before courts throughout Maricopa County who routinely receive probation without jail on first-time offenses like this. And I hope that I was able to give you a little bit different perspective on Tammy than what's out there. Because I think in this business, we get very jaded, and we get very tough skins, and we get very tough shells. Tammy is not a villain here. Tammy is a good, honest Christian woman, a businesswoman, and a, and a proper candidate for probation. I think we all know that Tammy won't have problems on probation. I think we all know that she'll do well on probation. And we're asking the court to give her that chance. Time, Judge. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me talk about a couple things before I talk about Ms. Smith's sentence. First of all, I want to make it clear. Tammy Smith is not being sentenced for the disappearance of baby Gabriel. There is a misperception that is out there. I see it in the letters written to me. The suggestion that somehow if Ms. Smith receives a greater sentence, baby Gabriel will be found, or that her sentence should reflect the fact that baby Gabriel's missing. That's not the case. The state has never alleged that Tammy Smith had anything to do with the disappearance of baby Gabriel. Now, we're going to talk in a minute about what she was involved in, which was interfering with Logan McQuarrie's rights to his son. But that's not what she's being sentenced for. If that's what she was being sentenced for, then the maximum term that's available here wouldn't be enough. But that's not what she's being sentenced for. And it's important to understand that. Because even the state concedes, and I think Ms. Andrews said today, that Tammy Smith didn't intend for baby Gabriel uh, to be taken. Tammy Smith doesn't know where baby Gabriel is, and that's absolutely the case. And I want to make that clear, that that's not what she's being sentenced for. What Tammy Smith is being sentenced for is conspiring to interfere with Logan McQuarrie's rights to his son and for submitting a fraudulent document to the court. That's what she's being sentenced for. One thing I also want to say is I want to tell the McQuarrie family how sorry I am that this has happened to you. I can't even begin to imagine the loss of a child that Logan has gone through, the loss of a grandchild that Mr. McQuarrie, Frank McQuarrie, has gone through, and the rest of your family. I am so sorry that this happened to you. Um, I wish there was something I could say to make it better. There's not. I wish there was something that I could do here in terms of the sentence to help find Gabriel or perhaps bring closure. There's not. But I hope that you're able to move forward, and I hope that you can find as much peace as possible going forward. And I want to tell you again, I wish that this had not happened. One thing I wished I would have heard from you, at least earlier, was the same sentiment to the McQuarrie family, because I think that's a big part of what they need. Now, you did just tell me that you were sorry and you were hoping that they would be okay, but it was buried deep within a much longer statement. There are times in this world that it's important to simply say, I am sorry. You may not agree with what the jury did. You may believe your heart is pure, and I can't judge your heart, and maybe it is. But you can look to the McQuarries and say, what happened to you is awful. I am so sorry. Without giving anything away without going outside yourself. And sometimes that's the most important thing you can do for them. And I wish I had heard more of that from you, but I didn't hear that from you. I know that you have been through some incredibly difficult times. I accept what I have read and heard about how you grew up and how difficult it was. And I can't go there either because it's so hard. And one of the things that you've said and I believe your husband has said, is because you had so many dif difficult experiences as a mother 
and having your children taken away from you, having your voice not heard, and people acting towards you without understanding where you were coming from, you reacted to Elizabeth Johnson. You wanted to help a mother. I understand that, but you should have also understood that there's a flip side to these circumstances. Sometimes when it appears that one side is right in these custody battles and one side's wrong, there's more to it. And without knowing Logan McQuarrie, without really understanding what the situation was between he and Elizabeth Johnson, what you did is you inserted yourself. Were you invited by Elizabeth Johnson? Yes. But you inserted yourself and you immediately assumed that Logan McQuarrie was wrong. That in and of itself is not an offense, but it is a crime when you set out to harm somebody's rights to their child. And without knowing everything, and again, perhaps because you believe Elizabeth Johnson needed help, perhaps you believe that she was being wrong, you went about a course of action which was designed to affect Logan McQuarrie's rights and at the end of the day make him give up the interest in his child. And that's simply not right. And you have to be able to see that. And the problem I've got right now is quibbling over a jury verdict or whether jurors got bullied or whatever doesn't go to the heart of what the problem is here and where I think the jury got it right. Did you interfere, did you conspire to interfere with his rights, and you did. You may have come at it with the right heart, but the actions were not right, and the actions supported the jury's verdict. And so I have to sentence you for that. But don't get me wrong, what you did was wrong. It didn't result, in my view, in baby Gabriel being lost, but what it did is it put Logan McQuarrie in a position where it became difficult for him to be the father that he was entitled to be. Is he perfect? No. Did he deserve more? Yes. With respect to falsifying a court document, I listened to all the testimony and I heard what was said, and I do not accept that you thought it would be okay to put somebody else's name in there. I don't accept that, and the jury didn't either. And that is something that even, again, if you believe if you believe what you're doing is right, and you think on it, you pray on it, and believe what you're doing is right, you need to be more aware of the people that you're affecting. I'm not talking about and listening to people on the internet. I don't care about that. I don't know what they're saying, and I don't care. What I care about is what I saw in this courtroom. And what I saw in this courtroom was a disturbing tendency for you at times to do whatever you felt was necessary to do what you perceived was right. You can't do that. There are some things that you're able to do because you know. Your business, it sounds like you're very successful. It sounds like you're a very good mother to your kids and Jack's children. But some things you don't know. You don't know how the legal system works. You don't know what Logan McQuarrie's rights were, and you didn't know the exact situation between Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie. And yet you acted, and that is what got you here. What also got you here are the things you said. I, I listened to you talk a lot about these bad things that people have done to you, but I will tell you in listening to the evidence in this trial, what I think ended up being the difference maker, your very words, what you said, and not what somebody else said or lies that people told about you, is what you said. And I'm telling you this because sometimes there's a disconnect between what you say and how you feel and how it comes out. Sometimes that's there. And that, I think, is what has happened in this case. I have been a criminal judge for two and a half years, and I have now sentenced, I think, well more than a 1,000 people. You start to get a sense for what the appropriate sentence is. At the very least, you start to get a sense of what do people who commit certain offenses, what kind of sentence do they get? When I look at your case, there's, as we know, the jury found that there are aggravating factors. When I sentence somebody, the law tells me to start with a presumptive sentence, and if there are either no aggravating and no mitigating factors, I stay there. If there's more aggravating factors, the sentence goes up. 
And if there's more mitigating factors, the sentence goes down. You've got two separate offenses. I can make the sentences run at the same time or I can run them consecutively. You can get prison on both, one or neither. So there's a big sentencing range here. I have to rely on what I see every day in terms of what is an appropriate sentence. And in doing that, not only do I rely on the, the sentences I've given, but I rely on the probation department to give me a reason recommendation. I know the state doesn't agree with the probation department's recommendation, and the state thinks, and I think there's an argument to be made that the probation department didn't see everything that we did, but yet that is an important recommendation. I listen to what the state tells me. I know that Ms. Andrews is an experienced prosecutor, and I take very seriously what she tells me, and I respect her point of view. I listen to what your attorneys tell me as well. Mr. Lee's been in my court many times, and I've found him to be reasonable and fair, and I have to put all that together. What I will tell you, though, and there's been some discussion about it, what I find to be interesting, and maybe Logan's had a change of heart, and maybe he was doing, telling me this because he's more concerned with making you have to go through probation and perhaps pay. But I want to read the following line. I don't believe putting Tammy Smith in jail would serve any purpose and is not the answer. My son is still missing, and putting her in jail would not bring him back. But if she has the burden of having to pay this money back over the years, maybe she would see the pain and anguish myself, my family, and friends, and a lot of other people have been through because of the immaturity and actions she took. I don't profess to have some kind of relationship with God where I can tell you um, what God's thinking or what is God's work. But I will tell you my perception, that sentiment is my perception of what someone who is speaking to what I perceive God's message to be of forgiveness, that's the message that I hear. Not pointing the fingers or saying, go away forever. It's more of a concern about what's right under the circumstances. And I appreciate that. And I take that to heart as well. So what's your sentence going to be? I will tell you that, in my opinion, based on my experience, someone who has no prior felony convictions and the nature of this offense, prison is simply not appropriate. And I will tell you, I don't think it's even a close question. I don't think you go to prison for this. And the reason I don't think so is because the fact that you have not committed offenses before, that I see this level of offense every day where people do not get prison, and it does not, in my view, meet the criteria applying aggravating and mitigating circumstances to uh, justify a prison sentence. So I'm going to give you probation, and the question becomes jail, whether you get jail. I'm going to give you a um, fairly lengthy uh, probation term, um, because I do think probation's appropriate, and I want to extend the probation term. Um, so you're going to get on both three-year probation terms to start from today's date. The question is jail. When I sentence somebody, I look at three things in terms of trying to figure out whether jail is appropriate. Punishment. Does this person need to be punished such that they go to jail? <clears throat> I look at protection of the community. Does the community need to be protected? And then I look at essentially the effect. Does this person understand and would this person be benefit from a jail sentence to get essentially a message regarding behavior. And I think under the circumstances, a brief jail term is appropriate, a brief one, because I don't think that you require a whole lot of jail, but I do think under the circumstances, I think it's appropriate for you to go to jail for a short time, because I'm not convinced that you fully understand and accept the harm that you've caused with what you've done. I don't think you understand and accept it. And to me, that's important, and that justifies a brief period of incarceration. And it's going to be brief, because I don't need to send a nine-month message. I'm also sensitive to the fact of who you are and your family, and I try and balance it as best I can. And so you're going to get a brief jail term. It's only going to be 30 days on one count. I'm going to give you deferred jail on the second because I want to check and see how you're doing. And we're going to come back because I do want to see how you're doing going forward. 
So we're going to create that system. So to me, the most significant offense from my perspective is the conspiracy to commit custodial interference because of the effect it has on Logan and his family. And on that, I'm sentencing you to a term of three years of supervised probation to begin from today's date. You're going to serve a 30-day term in jail. I am open to a request for work release because I do think that's appropriate. And again, it has to, I want to be consistent with the term that others get. And so I am open to that if there's a request in terms of work release. I'm imposing mental health terms. I think it's very clear from what I can see, your past and what I see in terms of your behavior, that it's important for the probation department to monitor you from a mental health perspective. And so I'm imposing mental health terms. That means you've got to cooperate with them. And you've got to uh, participate in being screened. This comes with some financial consequences as well. There's a probation service fee. One fee is $65 a month. That will not start till November. On count two, the forgery, I'm sentencing you to a term of three years of supervised probation to begin from today's date. I'm sentencing you to a, another 30-day jail term, but it's going to be deferred. When I defer a jail term, my intent is that you don't serve the jail term. My intent is, is that you do well and that the probation department confirms for me that you're doing well and I delete that jail term. That's what I expect to happen here. I don't expect you to serve that term. If you don't do well, if you don't follow the terms of your probation, then you will serve that jail term. It's the start January 5th, 2013. We're going to set a review hearing for December. We're going to come back. I'm going to ask the probation department to come and tell me how you're doing. And I'm going to hear from everyone to make sure you're doing what you need to do. And I expect that you will. Now, there's two other issues that were raised by the state. Number one, a request for a limitation on contact with children. I share the state's concern about what I've heard in terms of moving forward. I will tell you I worry about you opening up some kind of 501c3 entity and having um, teen mothers, young mothers come in with children. Um, I don't think you're equipped to do that. Um, maybe you could have people who help you that would. I'm not so convinced that I'm going to put a limitation on contact with children outside of hers. I just, under the circumstances, I don't think I'm going to do that. I am concerned about some of the behavior that you exhibited um, leading up to this case in terms of contacting individuals on the Internet with, that we saw in the trial, um, whether it's relating to the adoption of a child. There's been some judgment issues, and I'm worried about that. But I'm not going to impose some restriction on her contact with children. Because to me, it's when someone's a danger directly to children, and I don't think Ms. Smith is a danger to children. The second thing you asked for, with respect to an order, as it relates to profit or making money off this, I'm not sure what I want to do, and I wanna, uh, I'm going to entertain further briefing, because I will tell you I'm interested in fashioning an order that would accomplish what the state's asking for which is if a book comes out three months or six months from now that explains, here's my life experience, th this trial, here's what really happened, I want all the money to go somewhere else to, first of all, to Mr. McQuarrie with respect to appropriate restitution and then somewhere else other than in Ms. Smith's pocket. But I'm not prepared to fashion an order like that, and I want the defense to have an opportunity to respond and tell me and talk about the parameters of that order because I don't take it lightly but I'm open to it. So I'm going to um, allow you, you being the state, to file, if you would like, a request mm -hmm. for additional probation terms, and I'll hear you on it, and obviously I'll give the, the defense a chance to respond um, as well going forward, but I'm not going to impose that today. Okay. With respect to work furlough, is there some kind of request? I'm going to request instead of furlough work release, um, this is not a plea agreement, and the work release is... Uh, administered by the court, work furlough uh, would be different. We'd have to go get her a physical, and it's administered to the sheriff's department. Um, what I would ask the court do is on work, and I'm just going to take a guess at the hours, and Tammy can and stop me if, if I'm wrong. Um, what, what are your business hours? I mean, they're like from 8 to 7, but 
whatever. You know, why, why don't we say an hour on either side of work um, and say 8 to 5 and that she be released from the hours of 7 a.m. Uh, to 6 p.m.? I'll give the state an opportunity Monday to, Friday. to tell me what they want to on that issue if you want. Thank you, Your Honor. We object to either work furlough or work release. I, I just don't think that allows the defendant to get the message across that what she did in this case was wrong. If the court, however, is inclined to give either, we'd ask for work furlough, not work release. Work release is not monitored. Essentially, she could be out doing whatever she wants during those period, those hours, whereas work furlough is investigated and monitored and approved. But address about that. She's not eligible for work furlough because she works for herself. So work release would be the only thing that would get her out. In the sheriff's department, you actually have to have an employer uh, who writes you a paycheck. Um, so if she's going to be able to go to the business and work, work release is the only avenue that would get her there. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. I'm going to treat you like I've like I treat anyone else in this courtroom. When I have someone who has no criminal history and has committed this type of offense where I would categorize this offense, I would allow them to have work release. I think it's the appropriate thing to do, and so I'm going to allow you to have work release. Um, that work release will be um, 8 to 6, Monday through Friday. So my order will direct that there will be work release. Anything else from the state's perspective with respect to sentencing that we may have missed? Your Honor, if the court would just retain jurisdiction on restitution. I'm I appreciate you, you um, raising restitution. We haven't talked about specific restitution. There's not a restitution request. When you commit an offense, you're liable for restitution, and um, I can see where there would be, Mr. McQuarrie, the cost of coming here and certain things that I know would be appropriate for restitution, but there hasn't been a restitution request. I'll retain jurisdiction um, for any requested restitution going forward for the length of the probation term. Anything else from the state's perspective with respect to sentencing that we may have missed? No, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you. Anything from the defense perspective? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, we need to set a review hearing date. Um, the deferred jail term on count two starts on January 5th, I believe. So let's go into early December so we have plenty of time ahead. Pressure's on, Katie. Friday, maybe. Pressure's on. Maybe Friday. That probably makes sense. Let's look for a Friday. December 7th. December 7th. So we'll be back here December 7th. Make sure the minute entry directs the probation department to file a report no later than uh, December 4th and to be present at the hearing. Anything else from the defendant's perspective with respect to sentencing that we may have missed? You have the right to appeal from the orders of the court and to have a lawyer represent you. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. If you cannot afford a certified copy of the necessary records and transcripts, they'll also be provided at no cost to you. If you want to appeal, you must file a notice of appeal within 20 days from today or you will lose your right to appeal. You must sign a copy of the appeal rights and also your conditions of probation. You must also give the court a fingerprint. Failure to maintain contact with the probation department as required by your probation officer may result in the following order being issued against you. A criminal restitution order in favor of the state for the unpaid balance, if any, of any fines, costs, incarceration costs, fees, surcharges, or assessments imposed. Any bond in this case is hereby exonerated. Um, we have probation paperwork for you to sign, and you're remanded to begin your jail term. Good luck to you. We'll see you in December. You know, I may have missed it. Did you impose a, the, the mandatory probation and I did. Okay. $65 a month. There's no other fee okay. that would apply. There's a $20 probation surcharge, but there's nothing else other than the 65 and it's not going to start till November to okay. give some time to get set. Apologize, oh, I missed it, Judge. That's Thank all right. You. I'll see you in December. Okay. You may. Katie, can you shut off the mics? <laughs> 